Hello everyone and good evening, good morning, good afternoon, no matter where you are in the world and I know people join us from all over the place so um, welcome to those of you who are joining us. Now of course I'm going to be bringing on our special guest for the day, Leander Dalil, in a moment and we're going to be diving in to look at some of Elizabeth's arrivals and very interesting stories they are too and I'm really looking forward to chatting to Leander particularly about the Grey Sisters because it's not an area I've done a huge amount of research on and the, the, the stories are fascinating so I hope you are looking forward to that too. And so yes, if you are joining us, I can see people have already given us a thumbs up. So I'm hoping that you can hear and see me okay. Do let me know, do give me a thumbs up or a heart and drop a comment into the chat box and then I can know that you're all uh, hearing us okay. And uh, just to say, yes, who would I have? Kathy, oh, lovely Kathy. Hello, Kathy, how are you? Um, how's things in your part of the world today? And you're saying, I know the most about Jane, then Mary and Catherine, but would love to know more. Well, me too. So we're in good company here today. So yes, do let me know if you are joining us today, where you are in the world, do say hello. And, uh, and as we get into the chat today, what's going to happen is we've got about an hour with Leander and what will happen then is I'll kick off with just a few questions, but I'll be keeping an eye on the chat there uh, to look at your questions coming through. And um, I'll make sure to try and ask as many of those as possible to, to Leander in the time we have available. We'll start wrapping up about 10 to six, uh, just so I can give you a, a couple of updates on what's coming next. And we will try and finish promptly on the hour at six o'clock here in the UK. So a couple of other people have been joining us while I've been talking. So hello, Marsha. So you're in New Hampshire, you're visiting. So do you live in the US or are you traveling from overseas? And Anna, lovely to see you, Anna here in the UK. And Kathy's saying it's cold and snowy in, oh, we haven't got snow here yet. It's quite mild here at the moment. I'm not looking forward to that. Um, so Gail, hello Gail, lovely to see you and the lovely Monica in Italy and hello Susan from Illinois. So we've got a few people over in the US, we've got Europe and the UK represented so far today. That's lovely. So um, just to say for those of you who are uh, maybe new or listening to this on catch up and this is the first time you've come to these live chats, Tudor Talk, You'll be able to see my QR code, that's for Instagram. So I do most of my social media on Instagram. So if you wanna follow my journeys uh, and, and updates, then just make sure that you point your mobile phone at your camera at that, and hopefully that will take you through to my Instagram profile. Okay, well, I think that it is time to get on with the business of today. So I want to, first of all, introduce, give it a little intro to our esteemed guest for today. As you know, it's Leander Delisle, and Leander started her career as a journalist, but is now an author of a historic uh, nonfiction, particularly Tudor and Stuart. And I suppose the couple of books that are particularly interested to us Tudor lovers here are Sisters Who Would Be Queen, which is very pertinent for tonight's discussion, and Tudor, The Family Story. So I'm sure some of you have read those books and maybe you have questions about Elizabeth's rivals. So with that, let me bring on Leander. Hello, Leander, lovely to see you. Hello. Lovely to see you as well. It's Hello. Been... Now, I'm just wondering, you sound quite quiet before we go on. I'm going to turn the volume up at this end. Um, could you just, just check in and make sure that the volume is okay? Hello, does that sound better? I think that's a little bit better. Yes, I've turned the volume up here. Folks, let me know if uh, we need to do any adjustments with the volume when you go. But lovely to have you. Thank you so much for joining us this evening, Leander. <laughs> Well, I'm very pleased to be here. I've been looking forward to it. And what part of the UK do you live in? Where are you based, roughly? I'm here in what is actually sunny Leicestershire. It's been very sunny today. It's been a beautiful, um, well, I suppose it's winter's day, but it looks like a sort of mid-autumn day. It's golden sunshine. It's been lovely. Oh, great. Lovely, lovely, lovely. Yes, we, we, it's been quite mild, hasn't it, so far? We haven't been hit by winter yet at the moment. No, exactly. No, that's something to look forward to, I suppose. <laughs> 
So, so let's dive in. And uh, we were chatting, of course, deciding what we were going to do today. And you said, let's do Elizabeth's Rivals. What a great topic that is. I was been doing my little bit of research and, and the more I've read about it, the more intrigued. It's been a while since I've read particularly about the Grey Sisters. So it was, it was fun to read about them again. But I wondered if you could tell us though, what got you interested in writing about the Tudors in the first instance? Um, well, I read history uh, at university and um, I always enjoyed the story of the Tudors. I mean, it's 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 just so full of sort of drama and excitement, a time of sort of seismic change um, of, you know, wonderful personalities. Um, you know, what's not to like, really? Um, <laughs> yeah. It's just a great period. <laughs> it's got everything, hasn't it? <laughs> it really does. The glamour, the drama, the... Yes, <laughs> intrigue, it's everything. And we're going to be talking, of course, about Elizabeth's rivals today, particularly, I guess, Mary, Queen of Scots and the Grey Sisters. Are they amongst your favourite characters or do you have other really, you know, characters from Tudor history that really grab your attention, maybe that you haven't written about yet? Um, Margaret Beaufort, um, I enjoyed very much writing. I wrote about, uh, in Tudor, the family story, I started right back in the Walls of the Roses with, um, actually, um, um, with, with Margaret Beaufort and, uh, and, and indeed Owen Tudor, even before her, who was the sort of founder in a way of the dynasty, who was, uh, um, this, this sort of obscure Welshman who, who fell into a queen's lap at a party. I mean, I loved him. He was, he was an extraordinary character. Um, I, I like Margaret Beaufort as well. I, I enjoy, I'm reading, I suppose, about people who have been very maligned as Margaret Beaufort was and really looking at their lives um, and trying to see their point of view, their perspective. Mm. So I enjoyed that. Um, Anne Boleyn is eternally fascinating. Who can't be? Who can't be fascinated uh, yeah. uh, by Anne Boleyn and 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 indeed her daughter Elizabeth? Um, gosh, favourites. Um, I was very interested in Francis uh, Brandon, one of Henry VIII's nieces, who is um, who is another of uh, uh, Elizabeth's rivals. Um, no, well, she was a bit earlier. She was she was interesting as well. Jane's 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 mother, who was also very much maligned. Well, um, it was interesting because I watched your video on your website today, yes. and I enjoyed hearing you talk about Francis Brandon. And yes. uh, maybe that will come up a little bit more as we chat because yes. we do see her as the wicked stepmother don't we to the gray sisters absolutely absolutely and uh, so, always, so, I, I, so i'm always interested in in as i said in re-looking at the past trying to i'm trying to see where 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 myths have become have been created and to tear away the myths to find the real real people in the real story that's mm, that's, that's lots of fun cool. Look, very satisfying as well to do so Okay, so let's let's get right into the heart of it. So Elizabeth comes to the throne fifteen fifty eight. Who are her main contenders for the crown at that point? Who would be her rivals? Well, um, there is, as you mentioned earlier, Mary Queen of Scots. She is um, Elizabeth's senior heir in blood, um, but that is under sort of you know, English common law. Except, first of all, she was foreign born, so that could in itself preclude her from the throne. Uh, and secondly, uh, she has been demoted in Henry VIII's will, which has the backing of English statute. Um, so in a way, her more dangerous rivals and the ones she personally perceives as more dangerous are her Protestant English heirs, uh, Lady Catherine and Lady Mary Grey. Um, they're both English born and they are her heirs in English statute, in English law. So she's very anxious about them. And in particular, she's very concerned that they not marry and produce a son uh, if she does not. Mm. So, so we'll come to the Grey Sisters. And in fact, maybe we'll spend more time on them because I think it's the Grey Sisters that everybody knows quite a lot about Mary, Queen of Scots. You mentioned Mary, Queen of Scots. Most people who love Tudor history could tell you some of the highlights of her career. But I think if a lot of people were asked to tell us, tell, you know, tell me about the story of the Grey Sisters, I think a lot of people would not be so sure of their facts. So I think it'd be good to spend a bit more time on them. But let's just do Mary, Queen of Scots first. Um, so I suppose one of the things that I've always wondered about was, you know, how real was the threat 
of Mary Queen of Scots to Elizabeth's stability. I mean, they were such different characters with different upbringings, different conditions to deal with. Was she ever really truly a threat to Elizabeth? She became a very real threat. Um, well, she was always uh, she was always a threat. Uh, she was, after all, a monarch in her own right. Um, she had the potential backing of France. Um, so she was certainly a dangerous figure in that way. And then after the death of uh, Lady Catherine Grey, when she was only 28, um, she became more dangerous because the, the principal, Elizabeth's principal rival, as she saw her, Catherine, was dead um, and um, Elizabeth bastardised her children. And so Mary, uh, Mary became a much more imminent uh, threat. She was, however... And set that very same year, um, which was um, um, 1568 from memory, um, she arrived in England and um, and was imprisoned. So, um, so Elizabeth, I suppose, had control of her. But nevertheless, it was possible that she could escape, um, that um, or that you know that, that she might find um, backing in England, as indeed she did. Hmm. And I just noticed a couple of people are saying about the sound. I'm just addressing um, somebody saying, your sound is okay, mine's a bit quieter. So I've turned my sound up, folks. So just let me know if it's too, too um, if I've put it up too much or whether it's coming across okay or whether I need to put it up a little bit more. Okay, so um, we know the story of, you know, um, obviously Mary loses her crown in Scotland. She's forced to abdicate. She flees to England and then she has this long and sorry imprisonment uh, yes. in England, constantly trying to get an audience with Elizabeth. And, and I think one of those perennial questions that people ask is, would it have made any difference if the two had met? Would it change the outcome? What do you think? I think that's a very interesting question. The truth is that um, Mary's great enemies were the people around Elizabeth, and it certainly wouldn't have changed their point of view. That's where the real danger to her lay, with people like William Cecil, um, who were absolutely determined uh, that a Catholic not inherit the English throne. Elizabeth, I think, was actually slightly less concerned about that. And I think she very much wanted um, th relations between her and Mary to be good if, if she felt secure. Um, I think she felt a sort of sisterly feeling in a way for Mary. They were the fact they were both queens. They were both in this incredibly difficult situation of being uh, women ruling in a man's world and, and very much, and that was very much disliked um, in both Scotland and England. Um, and so and if they had met, I don't know, Mary was very charming. Um, it's possible she could have charmed Elizabeth. But, you know, Elizabeth would have had to have stuck her neck out almost literally to um, to have to have saved, uh, to have saved, to have saved Mary. And, stuck, and, and Elizabeth was a survivor at the end mm. of the day. Well, in the end of the day, she chopped off her cousin's head. Yeah, and as you quite rightly point out, the likes of Cecil and Walsingham were so committed to the Protestant cause. It's very hard to see that uh, the outcome would have been changed because surely Elizabeth would have continued to defer to, not defer to, but listen to people, men she trusted and was inclined to trust. That's where the relationship was. Yes, well, the danger would have been as well that they would have turned against her. If she had committed to Mary, Queen of Scots, inheriting the throne, they might have turned against her. That was always a threat. Don't forget, William Cecil uh, had worked, um, was um, Jane Grey's uh, Secretary of State. Jane Grey, who usurped the throne from not only Mary Tudor, people forget, also Elizabeth Tudor. But Elizabeth did not forget that ever <laughs> never trusted the uh, english elite um and um you know she put her faith in the ordinary people as she always said it was to them she owed her crown mm -hmm. and um mm -hmm. so i think she would have been nervous that uh, that um that even Cecil, who was so loyal, inverted commas, might not have been so loyal if, 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 if she had decided that Mary Queen of Scots should be confirmed as her heir or, or strengthened her, her place too much. Yeah. And so 
we, we, we get to the end, which of course is Mary's execution at Fothering Hay. <laughs> Elizabeth signed the document, although of course she would later protest that she didn't mean to have it happen. But, you know, did she, did she and was she right to put Elizabeth to death? To put Mary to death. Well, sorry, Mary. Uh, sorry, yeah. Yeah, but, um, yeah, I think yes. What, but was the manner of it really? What Elizabeth wanted to do and tried to do was to have uh, Mary murdered. This was the traditional way of disposing of a fallen monarch. It had been done uh, many times before, um, and. Then, you know, what would happen was usually they, they'd be murdered, um, say someone like Henry VI, for example, was murdered. Um, and then in his case, it was announced that he had died of grief and rage. So it always been announced, oh, dear, they've died of a head cold or, oh, dear, they've died of an emotional fit or whatever. So she, what she would have liked to have done is had Mary murdered and then announced, oh, dear, she's died of, you know, whatever, a bad moment. Mm -hmm. And um, <laughs> a natural causes anyway of some mm -hmm. kind. And 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 then the idea would be that Elizabeth, that Mary's former supporters would 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 unite behind Elizabeth, but um, the people she asked to do it wouldn't carry out her orders, which is quite interesting because if Henry VIII had ordered such a thing, you can be damn sure they would have been carried out. And yeah. it, and actually, it's a sign. It is a we forget because she was such an extraordinary woman and such an extraordinary queen, the weakness of her position as a woman, the weakness of her position. That she was just no, they were just she was just told no, not doing that. Um, and because you know, she was uh, Mary Queen of Scots was tried uh, and then executed, it sort of touched on the sort of divinity of the monarch. Elizabeth realized that's why she didn't want it done. Um, you know, and there's a there's a line you can draw from the execution of Mary Queen of Scots to the execution of her grandson, Charles I. I mean, at the time, they used an excuse. They said, oh, she, that, because she was accused of treason, but you obviously, you know, she wasn't a, a subject of Elizabeth, so you can't actually commit treason Quite. against, yeah. you know, a fellow, you know, another, you know, from another, somebody from another country like that. But um, um, they said that Scotland was essentially a subject nation, which um, I think the Scots would um, have uh, questioned. <laughs> um, but that's the excuse they used. So, yes, but. And when you say you can draw a line between Mary's execution and that of Charles I, what do you mean by that? It was like a sort of dry, dry run, you might say. Um, you know, they executed, they, ex they once they took the head off one, tried and executed one monarch. It wasn't going to be so difficult to do it again. I mean, they sort of twisted, they twisted the law and history to try and execute Mary for treason. And they just twisted it a bit more to try and execute a king of England as opposed to a queen of Scotland. Yeah, right. Just taking it one step up, just one notch further. Not so exactly. hard, as you say. It's only one notch. You're not going from ground zero. I just want to pause again because I've had a couple... Shannon and Emma, I'm hearing you. Um, I have tried to increase my sound. And if you see me leaning slightly over in this direction, it's because my microphone's here. So I'm not quite sure. Normally, I don't have any problems being heard. <laughs> <laughs> or with my microphone, but I'm I've I've put everything up to a hundred, so I can't take it anymore. I really hope you can hear me okay. And if there's any problem uh with the sound being a little bit low, my massive apologies for that. But importantly, you can hear Leander, and Leander is by far the most important person for you to hear here this evening. Um okay, I have kind of raced through. Mary, Queen of Scots, because as I said at the beginning, Leander, I'm actually really keen to get to the Grey Sisters. And 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 folks, if you have any questions about the Grey Sisters as we're going, um, please do note them down. I'd be very happy to ask Leander them on your behalf. So let's start from, from basics with the Grey Sisters. Everybody's heard of Lady Jane Grey, but she had two sisters. Can you tell us just a snapshot about them and about the family? Who were they in particular... Who were they in relation to Elizabeth as she ascended the throne? Um, well, their mother was uh, Henry VIII's uh, niece. So um, they were all of sort of Tudor descent. Uh, but they were descended from Henry VIII's younger sister, uh, Mary, uh, uh, the French queen, who married um, Charles Brandon, you know, Henry VIII's bestie. How could we uh, forget? Yeah. <laughs> um, 
Uh, yes, exactly. So they were they were his uh, grandchildren. They were Charles Brandon's grandchildren, the grandchildren of uh, Mary Tudor, Henry VIII's younger sister, whereas Mary Queen of Scots was descended from the elder sister. Um, and um, so that's who they were. And when Henry VIII was um, dying, he decided to make them the long stop heirs, the heirs to Elizabeth. And I think the reason was he was thinking of the princes, the fate of the princes in the tower, who we forget sometimes were his nephew, his uncles, I'm sorry, mm -hmm. his uncle, um, his mother's brothers. And he didn't want the same fate for his young son, the future Edward VI, who was also a little boy. He realized, you know, he was dying. His son was going to be a boy king. He didn't want a powerful adult royal or as, as, a, as a threat, um, a sort of Richard III type threat to his son. And so he wanted to ha have weak heirs. So he kept his daughters illegitimate and unmarried. Um, they were both uh, put in the line of succession illegitimate um, and he didn't have them either of them married, as he obviously. Um, and um, then he made the long stop as these little girls, as they were then, um, who so girls, not boys, um, and um, you know, quite remote under sort of common law. So, so he wanted to have these weak heirs. Then, um, when his son was dying himself, aged only fifteen, um, Edward um, decided to exclude both his sisters. He didn't want he didn't want um, his sister Mary succeeding to the throne because she was a Catholic and he was a Protestant, um, and he excluded her on the grounds that she was illegitimate. Elizabeth was also illegitimate, so he excluded her as well, and he passed the cousin straight to the long stop heir, uh, the senior one, who was Jane. Um, and then, of course, um, as it turned out, well, everyone expected Mary Tudor to just sort of give way to this. So she, I think her, her, the imperial ambassador, who was supposed to be her greatest ally, just said, oh, she's only a woman. <laughs> Basically, it doesn't stand a chance. Um, but, you know, of course, she was the sort of granddaughter of Isabella of Castile. Mm. So, um, and not to mention the daughter of Catherine of Aragon, both of whom were sort of warrior queens in a way. Yes. And uh, Mary's, you know, as, as we all know, um, raised an army and the people rose up for her. She took the throne and, and poor old Jane was overthrown and then eventually executed after another rebellion. Mm. Catherine and Mary, at that point, Catherine and Mary, she then sort of, she was quite, she, she was strange, in some ways quite forgiving Mary, having admittedly sort of executed this poor teenage girl, Jane. Um, so she took them in um, as her ladies in waiting. Catherine um, became, you know, quite a sort of, you know, was 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 served quite intimately on, on Mary and was in, back at court, um, and um, they were sort of um, well looked after until Elizabeth became queen. And then suddenly everything changed um, because, as I mentioned earlier, Elizabeth was very concerned uh, that these girls uh, were her heirs in law. They were therefore in a very powerful position. She'd already seen how um, the uh, elite around her brother, Edward VI, had excluded her from the throne, along with you know, her elder sister. Mm. Um, and she realized that they didn't want to have a queen, they wanted to have a king. If she didn't marry and produce a son, and one of these nice little Protestant princesses did, then it was quite possible that she would be overthrown and replaced with them. Mm -hmm. Catherine was a very pretty girl, teenage girl at this stage she was 18 Elizabeth didn't know she was already falling in love with an entirely suitable man Edward Seymour who was a son of the protector Somerset who'd introduced Protestantism to England he even had some royal blood I can't remember quite well uh, but anyway he was a completely the ideal sort of um, consort for an English Protestant queen um, and um, so Elizabeth when she became queen, she demoted Catherine out of the sort of um, presence chamber to, a, to, to, to a sort of a more obscure role in the hope of sending out a message to people. You know, I don't want you to be nice to Catherine. She's not important. She's very unimportant. Um, and um, Catherine was obviously aware that Elizabeth didn't want her to get married. So she kept her romance with uh, um, Ned, as she called him, um, secret. For um, But uh, they did... Um, marry also in secret 
And uh, there are wonderful descriptions, I mean, extraordinary descriptions, actually, which you just don't normally get in this at this period. Because they were later arrested and, and, and cross-examined, we have these transcripts and things which give us incredible details of the secret wedding right down to how they made love on their wedding night. Oh, you know, how they lay on one side of the bed and then the other, what she was wearing and not wearing. I mean, an unbelievable detail. And where did they, where's that detail? What, what, what documents are that are those details in, I should say? Um, well, I mean, you know, they're in sort of manuscripts of the, of the, of the transcripts of the, um, of, of, of the, of the interviews that uh, they underwent in the tower. Ah, right. Okay. So this, yes, yeah, so it was recorded later. How fascinating. How wonderful. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Everyone was interviewed. Um, and um, yeah, so we know, you know, how they celebrated, you know, obviously very, it, it, it was, it was a very private, um, <laughs> secret, uh, secret wedding. Um, but then what happened is, you know, they're both young, obviously, and very much in love. Um, and, and, um, quite randy basically so they were having you know sex secretly all over the place um um in every sort of palace in england really and um unsurprisingly oh i think that william sissel who was who was uh, related to um catherine was was aware of, was aware something was going on and so had ned and was worried that elizabeth would find out and it all end in tears mm -hmm. and so had ned packed off abroad oh, on a nice a nice long holiday, lovely holiday, lovely, lovely holiday. A nice little tour of Europe. <laughs> um, unfortunately, Catherine um, was already pregnant, and she was sort of she didn't say anything. I think you can imagine she's a young girl. She's terrified. Um, she's hoping that she's not really pregnant. Um, it's not really happening. Um, but you know, as every month passes, she gets bigger and bigger and bigger. Um, until you know she's essentially eight and a half months pregnant, people are beginning to whisper, um, and um, she doesn't know what to do. Um, and so she goes and talks to her former brother-in-law, who is um, uh, Dudley, Robert Dudley, who of course is the Queen's in love with, Elizabeth's in love with. And we forget that actually, of course, because her brother, her her her, her brother-in-law, Guildford Dudley, was married to Jane. So his, you know, of course, Robert of Dudley. course, of course, yes. You you do forget oh, all these all connections. Family. They're all family, exactly. Yeah. So she went to see him because she knows, oh well, he's 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 you know, he's Guildford's poor old Guildford's excuse, but he's Guildford's brother. He might help me. He'll put in a good word with the Queen, so she's not too cross. And so she goes and sees him, and they're on they're on a sort of progress, um, a royal progress. And um, then he goes to tell Elizabeth. Um, oh, so he does the deed. He's the one that actually does the deed, right? Okay, yeah. okay. Yeah, he goes and tells her, and um, Elizabeth just goes ballistic. You know, completely understandably. I mean, because it's her worst nightmare. Yeah. It's her worst nightmare. Her heir. Much as she doesn't want this girl to be her heir. Her heir in English statute is married to a very suitable husband mm. and is pregnant. Oh my God. So she's, Catherine is sent straight to the tower. Um, and um, Ned is recalled from, you know, having his lovely time in, in Europe um, and also packed off uh, to the tower, um, where Catherine promptly gives birth to a little boy. Even worse. So, even worse. So this is like a major disaster. Um, Can so, I ask what she was? I mean, she was was she just sent to the tower because Elizabeth wanted her there, or was it because she had married without permission? Is that the kind of pretense on which she was packed off to the tower? Yes, absolutely. That was you know. Although I don't think um, and it was it was fleetingly a treasonous offence to marry without a uh, royal permission. But I think that was um, with. That that law was revoked, I think, by Mary Tudor. Oh. Um, anyway, Elizabeth obviously oh. just decided um, no one was going to stop her on this one. I tell you, I mean, it's um, very harsh, isn't it? It's yes. very, it's very harsh. Anyway, yeah, sorry, no. I'm, I'm interrupting the story, but I'm sitting here going, "Wow!" I'm mean, just reminded how remarkable this story is. Anyway, yes, please anyway, carry so on. They, so they, um, because of course the marriage was secret. Um, they can't find the priest. Uh, the girl, the person who was witness, the girl who was witness was um, 
Ned's sister, um, another Jane Seymour, and um, who has unfortunately died. Um, and um, so Elizabeth says there's no evidence there's a, there was ever a marriage and has, has this little boy declared illegitimate. So that seems okay. That seems like that seems like a bit of a relief for Elizabeth. But then, the the the, the, the lieutenant of the town, the servants in the town, are all quite sympathetic um, to Catherine and Ned, to their romance and or everything. Um, and so, almost unbelievably, I mean, it is sort of gobsmacking, really. Um, <laughs> they allow um, a certain amount of corridor creeping. In the tower. So you have Ned going to visit um, Catherine. And again, you know, we have details of what, you know, what uh, the, the, as far as I remember, there was striped satin stuff on the bed. Anyway, there's literally descriptions of the bed. And, and there's a there's a letter Catherine writes let, later to Ned um, describing the last time he came to her and how she longs to be with him again. Um, which again is an extraordinary letter. You don't get this sort of intimate love letters, which are quite, um, which talk about love making and things very often, as you know, in the Tudor period, it's, it's just not something you come across very often. Um, anyway, then obviously someone gets cold feet and then, and then and the sort of cell doors are sort of more firmly locked. But needless to say, Catherine is pregnant again. It's now, astonishing. <laughs> it's astonishing. It's like how, the, the, also the um, you know, the bravery and the courage of it as well. You know, to... I, think it's, I think it's young people simply and madly in love, and will do just you know, <laughs> just losing and, it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, and um, so what happens there? Oh yes. Yeah, so, so now the, the the problem for Elizabeth, when she, of course eventually it comes out again, and she has another son. <laughs> <laughs> a second son. And the problem for Elizabeth here is that um, in English law and in English canon law of this period, a marriage is just a declaration of intent followed by consummation, followed by sex. So th this, this couple have, you know, because they've been interviewed in the Tower endlessly, but including by the Archbishop of Canterbury, um, you know, they have made their intent to marry very, very plain, you know, very publicly to everyone. Um, and they have clearly had sex and now had a baby. So there's no way this marriage isn't legit. Because um, you don't need a priest to marry. Mm, right. In fact. Yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? Um, or, um, you know, you marry each other. A priest doesn't marry you. So, um, yeah, so so that's... Anyway, so at this point, Elizabeth, of course, is again I'm very upset. Um, Catherine, by the way, which I think is quite interesting, keeps little monkeys and dogs. She has lots of pets which have been destroying her rooms in the tower. So the lieutenant of the tower, who himself is now thrown into, no, he was thrown into prison the first time round, actually, the first corridor creeping. But um, the new lieutenant of the tower, I think, is probably quite glad to see the back of her because, you know, basically she's been ruining her room because she's got all these small dogs and small monkeys and destroying And do we know it. where she was held in the tower? I don't know which um, room she was held in the tower, but um, I mean, I know the various places she was held in since. Yes. And then what was very tragic was that um, she becomes, she is very much the focus of a lot of attention because a lot of people like William Cecil, not least, want a, de a desperate for Elizabeth to name Catherine and her sons mm -hmm. as her heir, which Elizabeth absolutely will not do. And um, there's all sort of pressure on Elizabeth to do this. And uh, Catherine, meanwhile, is shunted off and separated from Ned and separated from her elder son as well, interestingly. Mm. Um, is shunted off to these country house prisons and um, becomes very depressed and eventually sort of starves herself and, and, and dies of a broken heart, really, age only 28. Oh, my goodness. It really has all the drama and the tragedy. And, and yeah. I just want to ask you a question because, Gail, thank you so much, Gail. Um, I've been waiting to ask your question about... If they had had asked permission, could Elizabeth have found a good reason to refuse? Yes, I don't think she would have needed a good reason. She would have just, I mean, she wouldn't have needed a good reason. She just have said no. It's sort of it's I, I don't I don't I don't approve of this marriage. She wouldn't have had to give any reason. And that would have been it enough. No, yeah, the no. says. 
<laughs> yeah. yeah, absolutely. So we've got one tragic. We've got we've got a couple of illegitimate boys around now. Um, uh, but and one tragic story. But what about Mary, the younger sister? Can you tell us a little bit about her? Because it's almost like unbelievable that it happens once and then it sort of happens again. I know. <laughs> I know. You know, people, you know, young people fall in love and they want and they'll do crazy things. Um, so Mary is very different in many ways from Catherine. Um, Catherine, the, the, yes, well, we'll come back I think, uh, to sort of pictures of Catherine. But um, yes. Mary um, was described rather cruelly by the imperial ambassador as crook-backed and very ugly. She was very short. She was the smallest person at court. Um, I think she had scoliosis, which, of course, Richard III, as we now ha know, had. And it's an inheritable dis condition. So she may have inherited it through... Uh, you know, down through Elizabeth of York. Elizabeth of York didn't have it, of course, but she may have carried the gene. Anyway, um, Mary had this, so she was the smallest person at court. And she fell in love with the biggest man at court, uh, something that William Cecil described as monstrous when it emerged. Um, he, this man called Thomas Keyes, he was in charge of palace security. And in those days, of course, everyone was armed. There was no paracetamol. So if you were in pain, you know, you were in pain. You were in pain and you were armed. Mm -hmm. And you were very young, probably, as well. So, the, so it was, you know, quite... So you needed to be a big chap to control all these very entitled, armed, young men. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Hooray Henry's with... Sword. <laughs> too much arrogance, too much youth. Yes. Too much too testosterone. Much youth, yes. <laughs> Plenty of alcohol, you know. Yes. So um, yeah, so you know, you needed to be a big guy. Um, and he was. Um now he they fell in love and um Mary and this was several this was uh 1565 and a few years after um i mean so catherine was already in the tower at this stage or had been even kicked out of the town was in some terrible country house um by this stage i think she was indeed um so there wasn't as if mary wasn't warned what might happen if she married but i think what she felt was that okay catherine married a nobleman a nobleman who could very easily become king of england who would make a very suitable king of england my, the man I'm in love with is a commoner. He would never be acceptable as a king of England. And indeed, uh, their mother's second marriage had also been to a commoner um, and had also been, in a way, a sort of message to uh, Mary Tudor to say, I, I, I'm I, not uh, interested in the crown. I've married you know, one of my servants. Yeah, I thought that was really interesting when I was, I was reading about that and listening to you talk about that. What a... And I think that says says quite a lot about the woman and her. Sh she must have been shrewd, intelligent on it and prepared to do the right thing for her family. Yes, absolutely. And there are advantages as well. If you were a great aristocrat yourself, royal indeed in their case, um, and you married someone of lower status, um, it also gave you a certain amount of power in your marriage. I mean, women, you know, had no money, no rights. As soon as you were married, you, you belonged to your husband. And, you know, widows had a lovely time. I mean, widows had yes. marvellous because yes. they were sort of women with their own money, they had their own power. But um, so, but if you were a great woman and instead of marrying another great man who was you basically you're going to be, you know, pushed around by him or could easily be, you know, if you marry a servant, that's all there are advantages to that. Anyway. Yes, back to I think story. Mary's case, in Mary's case, um, I don't think there was going to be any advantage, apart from the fact that she might be allowed to marry him because he wasn't going to be a threat to Elizabeth. So that was great. But she didn't want to take any chances. So, again, she waited until Elizabeth, literally until Elizabeth had left, uh, you know, go off to a party um, to get married. I can't remember which palace it was in now. Um, isn't that awful? Um, but um, anyway, so they got, um, so Elizabeth was offered a party and she and Mr. Keyes um, got married secretly. And again, there are lots of wonderful descriptions of this sort of candlelit wedding and the rings he gave her and all these sort of things. Very sweet. Um, but unfortunately, again, it did come out in public and Elizabeth was again very annoyed. Um, 
because she obviously decided Thomas Keyes wasn't grand enough to go into the tower, so he was sent off to the Fleet Prison. Yeah. He was stuffed into a small cell, which was quite miserable for a very large man. And um, Mary uh, was imprisoned for a while, for a long time actually, at Chequers, you know, the, which is the, oh. the country house, uh, which is uh, which which our prime ministers uh, use. And the, her room. The, the the prison room is still there and still has her graffiti on the walls. Yeah. Have you been? Have you been? Have you seen I it? I haven't been to the letters, but I have seen the pictures. Um, and the letters <laughs> wrote from there, and they've got sort of they've got pictures of sort of figures with wings and things. If she's sort of dreaming of sort of flying flying away from. And them. has she has she written her name? Is that how we know it's her? Um, yes, it's all her. Yes, it's her. It's her graffiti. Um, and she was in prison there. Um, and um, and they had yeah, exactly they were her letters as well, pleading. And she calls herself um, at first in her letters. She calls herself um, Mary Gray um, to Elizabeth. Um, but this changes interestingly because Keys is released eventually. Um, and um, he's sort of obviously not very well, and Mary asks if she can join him, and she's not allowed to. She's told, no, you can't, um, and Keyes dies. And Mary obviously never forgives Elizabeth for this, and she starts referring to herself as Mary Keyes, and, and there's a portrait of her as well where she's literally holding her sort of hand like this, saying, <laughs> wedding ring! <laughs> Stupid virgin queen, no virgin. Yeah, yeah anyway, so, um, and, um, but her life does sort of get better because you know, she's sort of kept in prison for, you know, for a few more years, but she is eventually released and does return to court. Um, and, you know, there's descriptions of her carriage and, and, and the sort of black and yellow dresses she wears. Now she's rather small. I was sort of thinking of herself as looking like a bumblebee in black and yellow in the 70s. <laughs> anyway. Um, and um, she is obviously living with her uh, a stepdaughter. Um, so, so, so she's obviously was bringing up or was close to her husband's children by an earlier marriage. He was obviously a widower right. when they married. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. And so, so again, it's a very romantic um, story. I, yeah, she's and she's a, she's she's obviously very bright, Mary. As well, she goes everywhere. These mountain of books she takes with her everywhere. Her books and rubbish. One of her jailers describes it as. Yes, I read that quote from you. I thought, oh, that's harsh, isn't it? Gosh, <laughs> but she seems like she prevailed. You know, she kind of yeah, yeah, yeah. she does. Yes. Which is sort of some glimmer of light in here. Um, yes. so, couple, so, so I'm just going to read a couple of comments. Um, um, since he's saying, so sad that the sisters and their beloved were treated so poorly. And Kiri's just, I don't know whether this is just kind of reflective question. Why did Elizabeth treat Mary and Thomas so harshly? There were literally no threat. I mean, thank you yeah. both for the comments and the questions that are coming through. Um, but yeah, I mean, she just really hated them, didn't she? She just... I, I don't know. I, it's interesting. I agree. I mean, she could have been a bit... I, I think that she wanted to send a message out with Mary, who didn't, as you say, pose a threat, um, that, she, that she was not to be messed with on the subject of the succession um, or on who would marry and who wouldn't. She would not be disobeyed. She would not be um, treated for a fool. I think that's what she probably was angry about that she'd been taken for a fool really by yeah. mary marrying um again you know another secret marriage yeah and what just so we can all get ourselves tuned in um over what period of time does this happen post elizabeth's succession is it all within five years ten years no no no, no, no it's, it's longer than that um because i'm sort of now sort of in the middle of another book i mean yeah this is it so um <laughs> Exactly. So as far as I recall, so as far as I recall, Catherine dies in 1568. Um, it's just literally sort of weeks before, I think, uh, Mary, um, Queen of Scots, arrives in England. Ah, okay. um, and then um, Mary um, dies in, I think, 1578. Um, 
but of course there are still others around um other cousins uh, you know elizabeth you know as you know never names an heir never names an heir and uh when catherine's um eldest son believe it or not fall also falls in love um and marries without his father's permission marries a gent a, a, you know he marries a gentlewoman again not a great noblewoman not a suitable queen consort so elizabeth actually is delighted about that and lets that marriage go ahead okay, it's like I yes <laughs> yes <laughs> He's made a really bad marriage. Hooray. Yeah, Ray. And do you know what I was just thinking? I was just pondering. So so the Grey sisters were the grandchildren of Charles Brandon. Is that right? Am I getting that right? Yes. Yeah. Yes. So I'm just thinking of Charles Brandon's little sort of um, event with Mary when he, was, yes. when he went <laughs> without permission yes. from Henry. It runs in the family. Really? No, absolutely. Really does. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. I think, yes. I think and that was... That was the that was again that was Mary, wasn't it? Really, who was uh, particularly drove that? Uh, yes, yes, yes. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Her granddaughters inherited her passion. Her, certainly, her younger two granddaughters did. Yeah. Anyway, family traits. I think we might be able to say they're quite headstrong and determined women. Absolutely, absolutely. Women of, yes, women of force. Even if yes. short stature, women of force. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so Zach has asked, thank you, Zach. Why did Tudor children have such a high mortality rate? Well, um, I think it was well, it was it was it was it was partly um no antibiotics. Right. Um, I mean before the advent of antibiotics, you know, you caught diseases, you 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 you, you died. Right. Um and it depends which class you're talking about. So, you know, the poor um could could be more easily you know weakened uh, by hunger during years of bad harvests there were endemic diseases the plague um they had this terrible illness called the sweating sickness which had come which had appeared around the time of the battle of bosworth uh, and then disappeared um 100 years later really um which which killed for example um uh, the, the 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 charles brandon's Yes, as yes. Uh, exactly, yeah. exactly. The half, half, yeah. Um, so there was that. I think as well. Also, court women would sometimes send off their sort of babies to be sort of breastfed in villages by wet nurses, and of course, then they would they would get whatever mm. you know bugs flying around in 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 the villages. So there are all sorts of ways a baby could die. Mm. Well, thank you for that. Thank you so much. And I've got a couple of things I really want to ask you because unbelievably we're coming up to 10 to 6. I don't know where the time has gone. But I, I really wanted to ask you about objects in particular, objects and places, because, you know, Tudor Travel Guide, I'm all about places. And um, so a couple of things. Let me ask one question at a time without getting too overexcited. First of all, I was really interested to hear you talking in your lecture online about the, what you discovered about what, where Mary Gray was buried. Perhaps you could tell us about that and like, that process of uncovering that. Yes. Um, well, no one knew where uh, Mary Gray, the youngest, was uh, buried. Um, and then I discovered uh, this uh, manuscript in the College of Arms, uh, which had been miscatalogued. And it, as as a, as a daughter of you know, some other grey, or sort of random grey, you might say, um, and it turned out to be the funeral details of the funeral procession for Mary Grey, um, and uh, it described who was there, uh, and they included spookily, for example, Catherine Grey's last jailer. He uh, was in the funeral procession for Mary Grey. Uh, and was himself of illegitimate Tudor descent, I may say. Someone called um, so that was called he's someone called Owen, as in Owen mm -hmm. Tudor. Mm -hmm. um, and um, there was also a lady in waiting, one of Lady Jane Grey's former lady in waiting. It's a name associated with Lady one Lady Jane Grey's ladies in waiting was also at this funeral procession, and she was buried in her mother's tomb in Westminster Abbey. Uh, so, and her mother's tomb is, you know, marvellous, you know, it's, it's, it's got a proper effigy on it, um, but it doesn't 
mention uh, Mary Gray, but she is buried with her mother mm. in Westminster Abbey. So, so that's where Mary's buried. Can you tell us what happened to Catherine after she died? Where was she buried? What happened to her? Because again, there's a bit of a story there as well, isn't there? <laughs> Well, yes, actually, she was buried at first in Suffolk, uh, where she died. Um, but then many years later, actually, just the beginning of the reign, just the end of James I's reign, the beginning of the reign of Charles I, um, their grandson, uh, William, um, had, was it their father? Was it their, yeah, no, it was, it was, it was Edward. Yeah, anyway, had them, um, had her, had her disinterred and, built a magnificent tomb um, at, uh, at Salisbury Cathedral for his, as far as I said, it was his parents. I'm getting the generation mm -hmm. used here for a minute. Mm -hmm. his, his, his son then takes over. Um, and so if you go to Salisbury Cathedral, you'll see this wonderful tomb, which has the effigies of uh, Catherine and Ned. Uh, with 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 Catherine very much in the superior position as 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 being royal, mm. um, and it and it describes how they were separated in life, um, but how the lovers are now united in death, and it's a magnificent tomb. And if you go to Salisbury Cathedral, it's definitely worth going to see. You see, I've been to Salisbury, and I don't think I really even noticed it, which I feel shocked oh, no. to say. So I'm, I'm going back now. <laughs> yes, no, it really, it's it's a it's a it's a very impressive it's a very impressive too. Definitely worth seeing. And, and kind of on that same note, I mean, brilliant discovery about where Mary was buried. Congratulations for that. Was was there anything else in the research process that you particularly enjoyed finding out, or that was was kind of a bit new in terms of an angle or indeed any particular artifact or place that you visited or sort of laid your hands on that was really interesting well, well I, I i did see um uh, the well i uh, which is the the original miniature uh, of uh, done by lavinia tierlink of of catherine gray holding her eldest son as a baby and it's very much a sort of virgin and child picture it's like the it's it's the christ child this is the future king you know the anointed uh, anointed um so that's why it's done this virgin and, and it's the first i believe it's the first ever secular picture of a mother and child in in english art um and it's a beaver castle and it's in the it's in the sort of private in the private apartments so it's not on public display so it was very special uh, seeing that, I must say, it's it's very beautiful and it's rather an extraordinary image and very touching. Yeah, um, lovely little miniature. And uh, I've talked to another guest about Lavinia Tierlink, but I didn't really realise until our chat today just how important that miniature really is and what it's really symbolising. So, yes. Yeah. Thank you for that. That's really interesting. And and in terms of places, we've mentioned a couple of places. Obviously, we've got the Tower of London. We've got um, Salisbury mm. Cathedral. Um, uh, Westminster Abbey. Uh, sorry? Westminster Abbey. Yeah. Any, Bradley Park, yeah. Brilliant, yeah. Any any other places that you would point us towards um, that that maybe they were, they, they were at, in their exile or after they'd been kind of rusticated from court? Well, Bradgate Park in Leicestershire is beautiful. Um, you know, on a lovely day like we had today, it's wonderful to go and 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 walk in in that park and amongst uh, amongst those ruins. Um, so, um, and you know, Mary Queen of Scots, Fotheringay, um, as well. Um, gosh, um, I just don't think if there's anywhere else associated um, with the with the with the with the grey with the grey girls. There must be lots of places in 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 London in particular yeah. um but yeah I would think well Bradgate is is their childhood home in Leicestershire and I was also thinking checkers but I don't suppose we can rock up at the front door and <laughs> say do you mind <laughs> it's, it's, it's a pity they don't open that to the public yeah once a year it should be open it's ridiculous <laughs> and of course it would have been nice to see lots of Mary Queen of Scots's artifacts at um Arundel but they were sort of nicked weren't they recently oh, when yeah. somebody was going around somebody was going around went it was open to the public and somebody used it as an opportunity to case the joint and stole 
stole her rosary. That's just I mean, terrible. Yeah. But it is maybe worth just saying to anybody out there who's watching that currently at the British Library, there is the Elizabeth and Mary exhibition, Rival Queens, which has some astonishing artifacts, including the checkers ring, which I'm so excited to see because I've never seen it before. That's going to be amazing, I think. Yes, no, I agree. Um, yes, uh, it's exactly. It's a wonderful exhibition and definitely, definitely one one to go and see. Yeah, so grab your tickets, folks. Get online. Grab. I think it's there till January or February time, so there is still time to get down there. But I think there are some wonderful artefacts. So, yeah, it's 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 got to be, I think, right at the top of the list of things to do if you're a Tudor, Tudor fanatic at the moment. <laughs> Thinking of rings, there's one other ring I'd like to mention, although it no longer exists, sadly. But I'm thinking of Catherine Gray's story. She, when she's dying, she leaves, she gives um, her jailer um, her rings to return to Ned, and one of them is a memento mori ring, and it has in, it has engraved on it, "While I lived, yours." Mm. Which I think is very sort of moving. Very um, moving. Just wish we still had it. <laughs> No, I know. <laughs> it's a pair. You never know. Sometimes these things do. Ah, well, I can't believe it's four minutes to the hour. And so I think we've come to the end. I, I just want to thank everybody for um, tuning in. And I particularly want to thank you, Liliander, for taking an hour out of your Saturday evening to come and join us and enlighten us, particularly about the Grey Sisters. It's been a fascinating hour. Thank you. It's flown by for me. I, I've really flown by. Thank you very much. I've enjoyed it. And so hopefully I'll see you around. And um, what we do need to ask you actually is mm -hmm. what are you working on currently and what can people look forward to from you? Well, I am writing a biography. Well, it's about just finishing it actually of uh, Britain's most reviled queen consort, Henrietta Maria. And it's a revisionist biography and it's going to reveal one of a woman who was in fact one of our most remarkable queens yeah. and uh, uh, and yeah there'll be lots of new stuff to see she's going to be uh, an extraordinary heroine to read about oh fantastic that sounds interesting we lo we love that and when is that due out august august september fantastic so something to look forward to towards the end of the summer folks that's month that's wonderful and in the meantime i just want to mention again from a tudor point of view your sisters the sisters who would be queen would be the the book wouldn't it i guess to to for people to go to having listened yes. to this conversation if they want more details absolutely the sisters who would be queen um which is all about the gray sisters the tragedy of Jane, Catherine, and Mary Gray, or Tudor, the family story, which I have all her, her other rivals, Mary Queen of Scots, um, um, her cousin Francis, uh, Mary Margaret Clifford. So, yes. They're all in there. They're all in there. Well, let me just read you. We've, as we've been just wrapping up there, we've had some people sort of showing their appreciation. So thank you for that, Kiri. Thank you. Amazing talk. Anna is saying, please come back, Leander. Um, oh, thank you. Uh, uh, Janet, thank you both very much. Uh, Cynthia, great to read your books. And Barb, thanks for the insightful and intriguing hour. And ooh, Henrietta Maria, love her, says Barb. Uh, really? so, so somebody else who loves Henrietta Maria. And, and Gail, so interesting. Thank you so much. So thank you again. And uh, folks, if you just step stick around for a moment. Um, but it's bye from us for now, Leander. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Bye. So, yes, we are at the top of the hour with just a couple of minutes. So, as ever, I just wanted to be able to say thank you again. I know we've had two tutor talks this month, uh, quite unusually, um, but I hope you've enjoyed them both. Now, there will not be a tutor talk in December, but I hope that we will be returning in the new year in January. I actually don't have anybody booked yet, folks. So, um, if you do have any particular favourites, people who you'd love to see on Tudor Talk, then then drop me, you can either drop in the chat or even better, put it in the description below um, because that's sometimes the chat doesn't appear once I finish the recording. But if you put your, your suggestions in the chat below, I'll certainly pick them up. And also you will also see in the description below, I've put links to the Sisters Who Would Be Queen book from Leander. So if you just wanna quickly go in, you Amazon UK, Amazon US, you can get 
uh, the books through those links there. So I've done the hard work for you folks. Um, and so, yeah, I think hopefully we will be back at the beginning of January. Um, not quite sure of the date yet. And therefore, the best way to keep up to date with what I'm doing is to subscribe to my blog, www.thetudortravelguide. If you go onto the homepage, you will see you'll be able to subscribe and you'll also get a free gift from me as a thank you for joining the Tudor family. And uh, that's the best way. I always send emails out to let folk know what I'm up to, what's coming next, whether it be podcasts or so on. And speaking of this, the final thing I want to say is I've just launched the latest podcast over on, uh, well, it's on major, all major podcasting platforms. And it's all about uh, shaping femininity, an interview with Sarah Bendel, who spent her academic career um, researching the finer details of Tudor, women's Tudor undergarments. What a fascinating subject that is. And there's an accompanying blog all about the busk. Now, if you don't know about the busk, I urge you to go and read about it. What a fascinating, mysterious and erotic double life the busk once lived. Anyway, you can find that on my blog. So that's it. It is six o'clock. Our time is up, folks. Have a lovely rest of day wherever you are in the world. Thank you so much for your comments. I'll have a quick look at those once I finish the recording and I'll see you on Tudor Talk in the new year. Okay, I'm going to wish you a happy Christmas. Bye for now. <laughs>